that Jillian Joseph, she's something else, boy. She, she, uh, I told Jillian, like, she believes in the art of the impossible. And uh, I call her the queen of positivity. So <laughs> anyway, uh, who I am, I should probably introduce myself. Uh, name is John Spence. I'm Grovant in Sioux, Fort Belknap, Montana. So Grovant, you know, we're, we're trying to use our more traditional name these days, which is Ananin or Ani for short. And the Sioux part, um, that's uh, Hunt Papa Lakota. My grandpa was Sam Marshambo from Standing Rock. And a uh, long time ago, he, I don't know how he got up to Fort Belmont. That's like 500 miles from Standing Rock. So uh, he married my grandmother, Molly Cochran. So anyway, Molly Cochran Archambo, she, that's my grandmother. My two older sisters, Avis Archambo and Marcia Ferfaro. Uh, she raised us along with an uncle, uh, Brian Cochran Archambo. And um, they, they took care of us. I never knew my, my biological father. Uh, my mother died when I was three. And this is, you know, I'm just, I kind of describe myself as an average Indian, right? I mean, I was, you know, raised by uh, grandparents and uncle. And, um, you know, they protected us, they raised us. And when I'm getting to the point of talking about culture, as important to us in, in recovery to keep, and, and even prevention and education from alcohol and drug abuse uh, that's uh, impacted us negatively so much. Um, Indian communities, you know, all over the place, and reservation and cities both. Um, but it was like, with us, it was, a, you know, it was seen. It, it was how we were treated, how we were treated with kindness and even though my grandmother um, didn't teach us Grovant, I, mean, I got to tell you, I was born in 1941. And my grandmother was born, we don't know exactly, there's a couple different um, years, but it was uh, maybe like 1898 uh, or something. And she took the journey in 1977. Um, so I just wanted to, so, you know, start out, it wasn't really cool to be Indian when we were kids in the 40s in Montana. And then we, we our family moved out to uh, Seattle on a program called Relocation. And my uncle, I uh, mentioned Brian, Brian Cochran, he uh, was a World War II veteran. And I guess with a combination of um, uh, assistance to veterans, GI Bill and the BIA's uh, relocation program, he got a job at Boeing. So we moved with him out. Of, um, I was in a third grade then, uh, and with our, my two older sisters also. We moved with him to Seattle. And of course, where did Indians go in that time? Um, as a housing project, a low income housing project called Lakewood, which nowadays I'm pretty sure would be called a ghetto. Anyway, so. So we were, uh, you know, part of that generation uh, of relocation and spending a number of years in the city. Now, as an adult, I went home to Fort Belknap uh, back in 1980 and worked for the tribe for seven years. Now, what I wanted to tell you that background is just, you know, how this all fits with me and what I've seen. So uh, I went back home in 1980. I worked for the tribe as a tribal health planner and then we started a group home called Wild Horse Youth Ranch. And so uh, I took the job there directing the program. And in 1982, I quit drinking finally on my own. Uh, not on my own, excuse me, with a lot of help. I was going to say on my own, I couldn't. And uh, that's part of this, this whole story. So, okay, again, I started you know, with my story a bit. And I'll kind of interweave it, hopefully, back and forth as we go through this. And speaking of stories, I thought it was a, this Jillian, she's kind of genius, you know. Um, the very first one of these power hours, hours was uh, Jean Tagabon with stories. And tomorrow, Jean's going to be on again, again with stories. So I just thought that, again, that was really perfect. Because, you know, with our stories, this is what 
you know, keeps us going and what gives us answers. Um, so without a written culture, you know, we're an oral, oral traditions, oral culture. And I love this. I love that idea that, you know, it's, it, it's getting more recognized through recent years that this is, uh, is what keeps us going, educates us and, and connects us. So anyway, um, let's jump. Let me, I'm going to jump back and forth because that's how we are. We're, the majority of us are uh, <laughs> we're, we're circular uh, talkers, circular communication, uh, circular worldview, you know, versus linear. And um, this is how we tell stories, right? We go back and forth kind of. And that's, it's, I'm, I'm really glad to learn about that difference, linear versus uh, circular, because that's how I am. That's how I talk. It's very natural. The other big thing, difference with us with mainstream culture, I think, is about um, introvert versus extrovert. And again, my in my years, 78 years now, I I don't know that there's any scientific basis to it, but I think the majority of us tend to be introvert. Now, that's nothing wrong. But oh, the other thing is nothing wrong with either thing. Nothing wrong with it being linear and circular because we need both to get along and survive. And same deal with extrovert versus introvert, even though, like I say, I think a majority of us are introverts and that's why when, um, with the generational oppression and genocide we faced, when alcohol was introduced to us, um, being, again, being very modest, you know, culture and valuing introversion, introversion and, and quietness and patience. Um, when uh, booze came along, wow, it's like, I don't know. <laughs> it was like medicine. It's like, oh my gosh, I can be introverted. I can be wild and happy. You know, I can hug everybody and, hey, how you doing? You, know, you go to an Indian bar and everybody's loud. Well, uh, that used to be how it was when I was a kid. So let me tell you, it wasn't cool to be Indian in the 40s and 50s when I was growing up. Uh, I, I saw the alcoholism and the poverty and this oppression, this generational oppression, I saw how that um, introduced a feeling of self-shame for a lot of our Indian people. And, and then, of course, poverty, unemployment. Right now, um, this uh, COVID-19 virus you know, has the country shutting down and businesses are shutting down and people are worried about money, people are worried about unemployment. Well, um, with Indian people, Indian country, I think we can handle this. I mean, you know, poverty isn't so new for the you know, majority of us. Now, I think it's uh, hit unemployment rate officially with the government hit a little over 10% or something recently, and it's going to be 20% or something higher, supposedly. Well, hell, on the reservations, we have always known the majority, you know, of the folks who are unemployed. But we survived, you know, we... And to me, what survives and makes us happy, the bottom line is the culture. So let's look at the top of that chart again, generational oppression, and I have these arrows going down, the result of that. On one side, fear, anger, lateral oppression. On the other side of that circle, I have shame and poverty. These are the negative things that, that happen to our communities, to our families. And again, I'm old enough, I remember that really well, feeling all of those things. Uh, feeling fear, That's the, that was the first thing. Uh, when my relatives or parents were drinking, I, it was a scary thing. I felt anger about the racism we experienced, the prejudice. Um, and you know, when I was a kid, it wasn't as bad on the reservation, but to me, the Starting school, public school, that's where it really, I really felt it. Um, you know, going to school in Harlem, Harlem, Montana is a little town, a little border town next to Fort Belknap Reservation. And um, Harlem used to be not too good for Indians. Um, things are better now. I'm going to get to that eventually. But so fear and then anger about treated, being treated different. 
and then kind of a, a definitely an internalized shame because you know we weren't as wealthy you know our clothes weren't as good i remember going to the catholic church in harlem and uh, some old white ladies uh, telling the priest well if those dirty little indian kids uh, don't sit in the back i'm not coming to church anymore uh, i didn't hear that excuse me my sister marcia heard that and um, so you know i was growing up with that stuff all the time well the thing about this internalized oppression or shame is that uh, a concept that I don't know when this came out exactly, but not too many years ago, the concept of lateral, lateral oppression came up or lateral violence. So I'm sure that uh, most of you know about that and, you, and you've experienced it. So lateral, lateral oppression that I've seen is where, you know, an Indian hurts another Indian, a tribe, uh, is feuding with another tribe and this Indian versus Indian thing is what really hurts and it you know it takes the form and we still do this to each other I see this happening today still a lot and it's it's kind of things like oh you don't speak you know like there's an indigenous authenticity test an Indian authenticity test it's kind of like well, you're not Indian if you don't speak your language. You're not Indian if you're living in the city. You're not Indian if you don't dance. You're not Indian if you don't sing or whatever. And all these things, or like, uh, you're not dark enough. You know, or all these these things that we do to each other that hurt. They really hurt people. And of course, another one is disenrollment. Jesus, I hate to see that. I hate to see us telling other Indian people who are tribal members that you're no longer tribal member you're no longer an Indian and uh, you know as much as casinos have helped incre increase our economic um, infrastructure and, and that kind of stuff I think it's you know that thing about money and so I hate to see that so lateral oppression it's huge and uh, we, we just I'd like to tell Indian people God get over it stop that you know uh, you know we're we, the way we can move ahead is to uh, begin to have you know, self-pride and learn to trust and, and feel better about each other. And a part of that, okay, so uh, I forget which one of the speakers talked about this dis dysfunctional family stuff of don't talk, don't trust, don't feel. Um, we got to do move ahead, and this is really true in recovery. In recovery from alcohol and drugs, You've got to learn to do that. You've got to change your behavior to talk, to trust, to feel with other people. And you're going to feel better. You know, it's, it's a different, um, it's a shift. It's a shift in behavior and thinking, thinking and behavior. Okay, so let me see. Back up again. So within the circle, if you can see it on your screen, I put all these positive things, all these things within the circle, and then these arrows going against to, co to counteract genocide and uh, generous oppression. So all these are good things. Um, I had put it right at the top, and I don't know, again, <laughs> I don't know, this is all science-based or whatever, but it's what I see. For me, this is my viewpoint, and I think probably a lot of other people are covering. So we need community. We've got to develop that to help us stay sober, to get better. And connection. And I get a kick out of this, this word connection. It seemed like last year, I think there was a big thing in the science journals about, well, hey, what's, what's going to help people in recovery is make connection. Well, to me, yeah, we've always done that. That's when you feel good, don't we? We feel good when we have an Indian or tribal community event, when we have a powwow, when we have ceremonies. You know, this is this is when we... We feel good. It's, so it's like this power hour thing. This power hour thing is, build, is building community in the Indian country. And I'm really glad that, you know, people are tuned into these. And, and I hope you can feel that, you know, we're all part of something. And we're making connection. So, again, connection we know is important. It's in our family and our community. We have, we, if we uh, encourage that and value that, um, that's going to help. And then right below that, okay, those are... Those two are in red and just 
kind of change the colors around here. Um, I have below that resiliency and renewal. I think it says renewal. That renews that should be renewal. I see that happening, especially since I quit drinking myself and began to appreciate, you know, re resiliency is like bouncing back, being able to handle things. Whoop! I don't know. Okay, we're still there. Um, so I heard people saying, well, we've always had that. And I think that's true, you know, with an oral tradition and stories, we hear things about how we have overcome as individuals or as tribes, um, you know, how we bounce back. And that's what we're doing now. And then renewal. And renewal, especially as a culture. Now, to me, um, again, my, my grandmother, especially looking back at my grandmother, she never lost that these values, uh, these incredible basic values of sharing and generosity. I mean, you know, we didn't have much. And when we moved out to Seattle with that housing project, you know, it's a lot tougher in the city to be um, uh, have, uh, sustenance, to sustain yourself, uh, self-sustaining. You know, on the reservation, I mean, you know, my uncle's going out there, you know, hunting and fishing. And if a white man's cow, you know, crossed over the boundary where he was going to be soup, you know. So um, we had prairie chickens and, you know, elk and antelope, you know, we had a, a lot more um, chance of, of survival. We get the city, though, you don't have that. So we then had to be forced to be on welfare, public assistance. In those days, it was called ADC, Aid to Dependent Children. And that housing project we moved into, I think it was probably 80, 90% non-white. So there, and uh, my sister and I, that was our first exposure to other races. I mean, here I was in the third grade, I'd never seen a black person or a Chinese or Asian or Korean, different cultures were, were in, that, uh, in that community, in that uh, project community. But again, um, the value, the, the basic values of sharing and generosity, that was my grandmother and kindness. And another one of never, of never um, causing others to lose face. My grandmother, she epitomized all that, even though, um, you know, she was, she didn't teach us the language, the Crowfoot language. And uh, it was going way back to her bad experiences in boarding school and the shame that, uh, you know, was inflicted on us. So, you know, as, as I got older and, you know, more hip to things going on, it, it just really, it really hurt seeing, you know, what had happened. And also to um, a, a brother of hers, uh, Frank, I remember when I drove home one time, it was 1970, I tried to go home, you know, every summer as much as I can. And I was driving back with uh, my Uncle Frank and my grandmother, Molly Cochran, uh, back to the reservation. We all you know, wanted to go back. And they were just happy as heck to go back. But they wouldn't go into restaurants with me. You know, I was driving uh, them and I, you know, going to get food. They didn't want to go in restaurants. They didn't want to go in cafes. And it was, again, this these years of... Uh, this oppression that hurt that hurt them, and they didn't want to experience that again. Anyway, so I'll go back to again these really positive things. So, culture is right in the middle. So, in recovery, I see a lot of this happening in a really positive way. The spiritual practices and the ceremonies that uh, that help people certainly help me. What we got there? Just okay. Anyway, um, I just, when you talk about the spiritual practices and ceremonies, I remember a Sundance when I was a little kid back uh, by the agency. I think it was pretty much where the, um, our powwow, the Milk River Indian Days, that powwow is held. And I remember I was, I was attracted to all the colors, you know, the different colors. I remember getting scolded. Oh, don't touch that. You know, don't go near that. And, um, but then at some point, 
you know, the Sundance went away for us. But again, with sobriety increase in our, you know, uh, red power, you know, pride in our native uh, communities, ourselves, uh, that, that's come back. The Sundance has come back. Sweat Lodge has come back. It was my first sweat lodge, I remember it was in 1972. I hadn't even quit drinking yet, but I, it immediately attracted me. So I was told by some elders, well, you, you, you have to be sober four days before you go to Sundance. I mean, into the um, sweat lodge. And I could do that. I could stay sober when I had something like that to look forward to. And then, when I actually did quit drinking, it, a huge burden, a weight was, you know, the lack of guilt was lifted, was lifted off me. Uh, two elders on our reservation, particularly, uh, Joe Ironman at Grovant and um, Max White at Cinnabon. And Max particularly, uh, so Max took me as a nephew, you know, in an Indian way. And uh, we spent a lot of time together out there at his place, uh, just south of the agency, a ways up by um, Three Buttes. And, and when I sobered up, well, other, other people, again, had been sober before me there, but just a few of us. And that got better and better and better. So that more and more people started coming out to Max's, especially like, uh, for sweat lodges. And we had a lot of fun. I've got a word down there, right below there, humor. I already talked about the importance of stories. Well, the other thing, I, you know, which I love about us is humor. And like Casey Nicholson yesterday and, and also uh, Robert Johnston and everybody, excuse me, seems like all the uh, presentations have had a good deal of laughing and storytelling, humor. And uh, the other things, again, in that circle, positive things that I see for our recovery and happening is our music and art. Uh, and then next, I've got below that movement. I really like that word and that concept. And he, this is, um, oh, what's his name? Uh, Thosh Collins. I remember some presentation of him a while back where he talked about saying movement is uh, like we were, as natives, we were way back, we were uh, movement based and we were positive with each other. And I like that, it's like way more, than it's, it's just kind of a, I think a neater word than just exercise. So movement, you know, all kinds of different movement. You know, when you get, when you get sedentary, you know, we're gonna get, we're, we're gonna get unhealthy. But like, okay, even like diabetes. Uh, this is even science has shown that uh, with uh, exercise and nutrition, and there I have the word food down there below, uh, this is how we can reduce this really plague of diabetes that we've, we've had in our communities for a lot of years now. So um, also I remember years ago, Billy Mills saying that same thing, that with exercise and nutrition, uh, diabetes in our communities can be improved. And actually, um, there's a study here. Uh, there's probably more than that, but like in the Cow Creek tribe here in Oregon, uh, Dr. Sharon Stanfield, she's from Montana, actually. Uh, she, had, she has really been big on that. And uh, she can show reduction in diabetes through, through that, through movement and food. But underlying both of those things for diabetes and, you know, recovery from alcohol and drug abuse is culture again, all right? Because it all, all those things are positive things with us. And then there, I added uh, right below in blue, water. Okay, uh, I remember years ago, different um, traditional people saying, well, we start the ceremony with water. And, you know, I like water as much as anybody else, but I'm like drinking too much Coke and coffee and even as even in sobriety. But gradually that's, I think that's increased. And 
then again, water it has a power as a spirit. I think that's what's been happening a lot. And, uh, oh, these days, God, I, I have to have water by my bed. And that's a, that was a teaching from a long time ago. But now I can't, uh, man, I got to have water right there. And I'm drinking way more water these days. And I see uh, our Indian folks carrying around more water. So this is, you know, really a positive thing. Another thing about water that um, when I decided to put it in that circle, God, it's got to be there, is Standing Rock. Water is life. And then also, okay, so Standing Rock too, the importance of water, protecting our water, and the spirit of water. Another cool thing, how that fits in water with um, this discussion about recovery in Indian country, I bet you a lot of you went to Standing Rock, right? Uh, you can put up your hands there. Who all went to Standing Rock? Or Tell who, us to click like. Oh, I guess you... You're supposed to click light if you went to Standing Rock. Oh, I love it. Seeing all these all these cool heart signs and thumbs up, <laughs> thumbs up signs. What, you know, remember when we, I went there twice, September and then December. December with the veterans. This is 2016. Remember when you entered the camp there? There were, uh, there was always security right at the camp. The first time I went, there were two, a couple of young guys, real young guys. And there was a sign. It said, no alcohol or drugs. And I loved that right up front. This was a spiritual movement. This is a spiritual awakening. For a big, large number of people, it was like, it was the water, to save the water, to save the land from being polluted by the Dakota Access Pipeline, DAPO. Um, that's what drew people, not only just us, Indian people, but God, people from all over the world. I like that there was a big sign there, uh, Standing Rock has awakened the world. And it's really true. You know, you'd walk around camp and there were accents uh, from Germany, uh, Spain, and Mexico, and gosh, uh, Sweden. France, all over the place. And also I remember that uh, afterward, um, John Eagle Sr. John Eagle is an incredible uh, horseman. He's the best I've ever been around. A natural horseman. Uh, and using um, cultural context to work with horses and teach about, you know, how that can help our, us uh, recover both as, as communities and as individuals. Anyway, one of his... Um, Horse uh, workshops. I've been to two of them over there at Standing Rock, and then one out here at the Umatilla Tribe. Uh, John, at one point, he's the cultural. Let's see. Oh, tribal his historical preservation officer. That's right. So one in one of these um, workshops, John mentioned um, that there were 380 flags, tribal flags, that came to Standing Rock. And the power of that, of us coming together, was something that uh, none of us ever forget. You know, they, um, the elders got this going. Um, youth, a youth, bunch of kids from the tribe actually, you know, ran all the way to D.C. And then the elders, what was so cool, I remember about camp, there's no written agenda. <laughs> you know, talk about uh, circular versus linear. No written agenda just the elders and the tribal people from Standing Rock uh, deciding on the order of who's going to present and what's going to be talked about. And it was a, a thrill for everybody when a different tribe, a new tribe would arrive and, and everybody would, sh would be shouting and happy. And then that tribe would be invited to do their song and dance. And it was uh, just amazing coming together. But again, water. You know, water is life, how important that is. So, okay then, so all those things in the circle, uh, you know, super powerful and, and a, a neat thing to, uh, to be part of. So then right below, again, so I get culture and healing. So this healing part, I love that, in, oh, I don't know when, 
recent years, we're using that word. It's really spreading because that's what we got to do to heal from. We got to heal from this genocide and generation of oppression. And again, I've got to brag on Jolene. I know that healing as a word and a concept and something we need to do as communities and tribes. I know that, you know, it probably was talked about at different times. But as Jolene and her group got together in 20 years, I hear the 20 years of this year. It's healing, healing, healing. Healing people, heal others, you know, and hurting people, hurt others, you know. And so I, I love that idea and the word, and we're you know, using it more, and it's powerful. So um, right below that, written in blue there, I've got the word abundance. And I added that as I'm putting this thing together. The uh, second group was the Young People uh, Indigenous 20-something project. I think they were the second ones. And in there, someone, uh, maybe it was Shailene Joseph, Shailene I'm talking about, when they got together, this, this group of young people, what they're going to do, they're changing the cycle. They are changing this cycle of oppression and this great renewal, this renaissance in Indian pride around the country. They're changing that cycle. You know, that cycle used to be when I was a kid, you have to drink. You have to drink. You have to be, almost even to be Indian, you had to drink. So the Indian bars, you know, God knows it. You can't go to Indian bars sober. You just, anyway, um, this, they mentioned abundance. that They founded their uh, project a lot on the idea of what we have as a culture, what we have as a, as a people. And uh, then below that, I was, I put some organizations that I see working on that idea and really helping. Number one, I have NARA, Native American Rehab Association. That started in 1970. It's going to be 50 years. They're celebrating this summer. So now it's uh, the official, it's NARA Northwest Inc. NARA Northwest Incorporated. Uh, oh, I just have a little, Laura right here. <laughs> Here's Laura. <laughs> Laura. Laura's a Nara baby. <laughs> yeah, she went home to Montana to work for a lot of years on this net. But a lot of us old timers were around when Nara started. We remember uh, Laura was uh, like we call her Laura from Nara. Her mother, Sydney Stone, was the director for ten years back in the eighties. It was all the eighties, yeah. And Sydney, Doctor Sydney Stone Brown. Sydney just did an amazing job. They really grew Nara. She. It was during Sydney's, uh, when she was director, that uh, they started the um, family program where we were one of the, we probably were the first Indian program that allowed mothers and children to come into treatment at the same time. Now, I don't know if there's many even non-Indian programs that do that, but NARA started that with Sydney, and it's been going real strong. It's a great thing. So I want to go through these a little more quickly, I guess. NICWA, National Indian Child Welfare Association. That's also here in Portland. So we're really fortunate here in Oregon. We have NARA based in Portland. Now it's a, just a, you know, a comprehensive uh, program of wellness and physical health, a health clinic and treatment, uh, both adult, inpatient, and then adolescent, young people, uh, young people coming into treatment about two years now. Okay, so NICWA, National Indian Child Welfare Association, that's based in Portland. It started here with Terry Cross. It started as a regional Northwest Indian Child Welfare Association. And Jolene was in on that too, getting that going. And then uh, next one I had is Nanakoa. I don't know what year that started. I'm not sure that's even going again, but that was National Association of Native American Children of Alcoholics. So that was especially big during the 80s when recovery was really taking off in Indian country. And it was really good because Nanako brought together a lot of Indian folks in their conferences. And I remember, let's see, oh, what was it? Anna Latimer and Joanne Kaufman, especially, uh, getting that together. And oh, Ozzy Williamson, Ozzy from Browning. Uh, a lot of us back in like especially the guys 
who sobered up in their 1980s and even the 90s. We used to call Ozzy our horror power. <laughs> Ozzy really got things going. He got the uh, he started the intertribal sobriety campouts, and we do we used to do it every summer on one of their reservations in uh, Montana. There's seven reservations in Montana, and we had a sobriety camp out one or more times at, at every one of those reservations. And then next, I have NWI, Native Wellness Institute, 20 years now. And, uh, you know, Jillian could talk more about that. She did it the first. But I tell you, I'm one of the biggest fans of Jillian and her staff. They tend to be younger groups. There's Charlie Tilt and there's me. We're the only old ones, I guess, that, that come in. Uh, and I'm older than Charlie. <laughs> but anyway, so for uh, oh recent years, Jillian has been having, inviting myself and um, what, one of my coworkers, who is a Cow Creek tribal member, uh, Amber Jones. And we've been bringing horses to her uh, the summer camp that's called uh, wellness warriors. And, oh, I guess we've been doing that four years. We're trying to do it before, but, uh, at different campsites, they did all our horses. Anyway, that's what we're doing now. And, uh, that's what I can contribute, try to contribute in, to the camps is bring the horses. There's enough great trainers, especially the young folks. And then Charlie who brings in, you know, so much culture teachings, you know, as an elder. And then right there, following that, is um, Indigenous 20-something project. Again, this is Shailene and her crew. Um, they were, I think, in the second one of these power hours, Jordan and, um, uh, let's see, I forget the names of the other folks that were on that one. Really a good session. Now, they're more technical advanced than the rest of us. They had... I guess they had like four screens going and and it was really great to see all these young people again. These young folks are going around all over the Indian communities and uh, helping people heal. And, they, and you know, their message too is prevention. We don't have to all become drunk Indians, for God's sake. Like, you know, like so many of us were back in the 40s and 50s. And, you know, this is this is changing. And they're helping it. I think they went to, they've done over 50 different visits to communities to help out. Really a great group of young people. I'm very encouraged seeing that. Uh, next, I've got Gona, Gathering of Native Americans. So I believe that started in the early 90s. Uh, my sister Avis was one of the folks that helped write the curriculum. Theta, Theta, I hope you're out there. Theta, Theta is, of course, one of the founders and uh, John Bird, and who else was in there? I forget the names of these other folks. I remember it as being like an Indian think tank. So um, SAMHSA, it's a federal agency, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Service Administration, had a brilliant idea to bring in a bunch of Indian folks from around the country. And so they got a great bunch of people together, and they formed GONA as a curriculum. And going again as a healing curriculum for, from alcohol and drug abuse, that was the deal. It's been going on since then, since the early 90s, all over the place. And to me, this should be a, a, uh, an evidence-based practice. You know, it, it should be, it, given the evidence is that it's gone all over, it's been replicated, uh, all kinds of communities have benefited. Let's see, I've been able to participate in two no, three Gonas. The first one was in 1999 on the Warm Springs Reservation. Then there was one in Salem, Oregon. And then um, one in Portland. And Jolene and Theda, are, you know, kind of some of the uh, really good presenters. And Robert, I forget all, all of them. But NWI uh, uses that method a lot, too, the different communities. And then right next to it, I have White Bison. And this one, uh, I believe, Don Coyas and his group. I know Ozzy Williamson was on his board also. That was in um, the late, let's see, it was 1988. So White Bison's been around a long time. And I didn't write under there, but there's another program started through White Bison called Well Variety. 
I really see this helping a lot with the younger folks who are in recovery. Um, they, well, Bridey, like, it sort of combines AA and they really in, uh, Indianize it. They use a talking stick. Uh, they start out in ceremony. And uh, I see, especially here in Portland, I'm not sure other places, but it's national. So um, I guess I don't want to, I shouldn't say people's names out of uh, respect for anonymity, but I know a bunch of young people who, who participate in that. And a lot of them are like drummers and singers. Uh, and they're younger folks who are really uh, using culture in recovery. So all of these organizations that I have listed there, the bottom line is culture. All of these groups, that's what's going to heal us from this um, you know, generational oppression and get us away from alcohol and drugs. Um, next to it, there's four lines There's in blue. That's kind of like a scientific approach. Um, it's like a, curcu- a continuum of care, it's called. So to keep from addiction and self-harm, you know, self-destructive behaviors, uh, this is kind of a linear uh, description. I mean, it's all good. Uh, for, it's a scientific approach. Like, you know, first you do education. Like, hey, alcohol isn't good for you. It's a toxin. It's a poison. I mean, right? People die from alcohol poisoning. It's a poison. If you drink too much and too fast. But I have right next to it, as part of education, um, from our viewpoint, is add language. Now, this is so really personal again. Uh, my grandmother was afraid to teach us Rowan language. Uh, It was just, you know, it was when she was a child, it was hurtful to her. I remember, though, when she would, you know, have a couple drinks and her contemporaries would get together. They'd be just laughing and going on in Grove on language. It was really, it was really neat. But at the same time, it was sad because um, my two sisters and I weren't taught it. So we only know a few words. Now, what's great about what's happening today is language immersion for a lot of younger kids. At our tribal college at Fort Belknap, it used to be Fort Belknap Uni College, but we got back traditional names. It's Ani Nakoda College, ANC. Uh, They have a language immersion, and our two two, um, tribes that were placed there, you know, Grove on the Cinnaboy, Ani Nakoda, uh, that's what's taught there. Uh, Recently, my sister Avis and I went back for our workshop uh, invited by the uh, tribe about uh, alcohol and drug prevention. We, we went to the high schools and talked with the, the school assemblies and things. And But one of the workshops was right there at the college. And it was so cool to see these, these younger folks you know, speaking their language and, you know, seeing the language classes. It's a really encouraging thing. And then we have two great people at Fort Belknap. Uh, Tuffy Helgeson on the Cinnaboy side and Leo Brocky on the Rovant side, uh, continuing that language and just really uh, giving us a boost. And so you go home now, to Powell's, and you, you hear the language more. It's a, it's a really neat thing. And the prevention as part of that continuum is just how can we educate people? How can we have fun, like alcohol, drug free activities? And this is where. Uh, NWI really comes in a lot, the prevention idea. So Jolene's been doing this for 20 years, her and her team and their dynamite crew. Uh, they're, uh, they're different um, summer workshops. This last one that they had last summer at the uh, Confederate Tribes of Grand Round was amazing. They had over 300 kids, I believe, at least 300. And around 15 of those kids were from New Zealand. And uh, my coworker I mentioned earlier, Amber Jones, and I brought, well, we brought five horses that time. And, uh, we're, you know, we worked with the kids for a couple of days, and it was really fun. To, uh, uh, that last workshop we had with kids, uh, this crazy Jolene, she, again, the art of the impossible. 
So we missed a, uh, a session the day before, the first day. The kids, the horses got tired. So Jillian says, oh, we got to make it up because uh, some of these kids really wanted to go to the horse session. It's, you know, it's called equine therapy, fancy word. It's a horse therapy. And uh, so we brought our horses there that morning and we're waiting for things to start. All of a sudden we see these kids coming. Oh, we got more and more and more. We wound up with 71 kids at a workshop with five horses. Uh, <laughs> boy, I started getting anxious, but it all worked out. It worked out great. And part of the reason I look back why it worked out so great, there were three elders that were there. There was Charlie Tailfeathers. There was the guy, his nickname Papa, the guy from New Zealand. And then Art McConville from Umatilla. And then I had, you know, I was there too, but their presence, their presence allowed that to happen. Those kids were so well behaved. They were so respectful. Those is because of the elders. So again, um, we always want to include them. We want to, you know, bring them in at every stage. But I, I saw the evidence of that so much on that particular workshop of the horses. And then treatment, I mentioned Nora, you know, 50 years now, there's other native treatment centers, but that's the one I know, that's the one I'm close to, uh, incredible. And then aftercare is really huge. That's the part when someone gets out of treatment, how can we help them get sober? How can we unite them with the family, the community that they come from? That's really tough. The, uh, the lack of funding in aftercare is what's really hard. We could have way more success in treatment if we had more resources like housing at home back on the reservation or here in the city if people want to stay uh, and find work here if we could get really good housing for them so the shortage of treatment resources on the reservation and here in the cities is what uh, uh, we need we need to correct that more if we're going to do it better with aftercare and then uh, the last thing in red there, I have tribal best practices. I want to share that about what's been happening in Oregon and can really happen all over the place. But in Oregon, uh, a, a law was passed, a state law a while back, I think it was 2003, that mandated evidence-based practice. That's research-based practice. Well, the tribes here right away recognized, hey, that, that's not going to work for us. We can't be required to use some uh, franchise program, some external program that was developed in a non-Indian community. So the tribes came together, all nine, and developed um, a list of tribal best practice. I just want to share a few of them. There's like 22, I guess, the last I heard. So sweat lodge, powwow, round dance, canoe journey, course program. Those are the ones I wanted to talk a little bit about because, well, I, I know about them the best and I see just the tremendous impact they have. So what this means is that uh, for Oregon State funded program in alcohol, drugs, and mental health, instead of being required to use 75% of your funding for an evidence-based practice, Oregon through statute now allows tribes or here in Oregon, uh, I mean in Portland, any community, to use tribal best practice. It, use, it allows your staff time for these activities. It allows you to buy materials that promote those things. So like it isn't, you know, it isn't just fun. It isn't, you know, yes, we're having fun in all these activities and we're teaching things and we're, you know, our, our people are learning things. The young people are learning things. It's helping people, adult folks in recovery to stay sober and, and get better. Uh, but all these things I see work. I mean, I, I guess, you know, I looking back on these 37 years sobriety, uh, I see these cultural based things working the best. And the, these particular ones I mentioned, these best practices are just, you know, fantastic. So sweat Lodge is a healing method. Uh, powwow has got it coming together, make connection, community. 
uh, the humor, the fun in powwows. Round dance, oh, geez, that's incredible activity. Uh, Grand Round's been doing an annual round dance now for several years. I remember the first round dance I went to was up in Canada in around 1984. I mentioned uh, Max White, a Cinnaboyne elder. Uh, he asked me and Harvey King to go with him and help him drive. And we didn't, hadn't been to round dance. We didn't know what the heck this was. We went up to Canada there, and it was just amazing. And thank goodness, you know, that that old ceremony is coming back. It's actually a ceremony around dance. It's the dance itself, but also the event called a round dance. And now uh, families are putting on round dance. It's cool. Canoe journey, that's huge out here in the Northwest. And it's estimated like 10,000 people attend. That's the biggest sober gathering of people you know, as a prevention and treatment method. Because a lot of people are, are you know, are, they're canoe tribes. And getting back to the canoe, you, know, you can't have alcohol, drugs, or bad behavior when you're carving a canoe, or when you're cutting down the tree for the canoe, or when you're in the canoe uh, pulling. That's it. <laughs> I learned you got to say pulling, not paddling. Okay. So the canoe journey is huge, and I was, I was fortunate one year, Grand Round invited me to uh, get into one of the canoes, and man, that's hard work. We uh, went from Nisqually Reservation up to uh, Puyallup. I forget how many hours that was. It. So these guys do this for like 10 days. It's amazing. Uh, I was uh, really impressed. I've been to, I think, three of them. There's just the one where I actually was invited to get in the canoe. It's fantastic. And again, the whole thing is culture-based, no alcohol and drugs, very strict. I mean, there might have been 10,000 people at this one gathering. I didn't see one drunk in it. Nobody's staggering around. That's incredible. When you think of all the things that happened to us, the incidents of PTSD in our communities, um, that is amazing. Talk about prideful. Uh, and then the horse program. Well, of course, that's the one I've been working with for 11 years now. I started as a volunteer at this Mustang Rescue Ranch out um Oh, a little ways west of Salem. Started as a volunteer and then gradually uh, started doing contract work at that. So it's, uh, well, I like what Umatilla, their program, the colleges played horse medicine. Now they have a tribal language name for that, which I can't pronounce, I don't remember, but the basic thing is horse medicine. Um, my co-worker from, Grand Rap from Cow Creek again, Amber Jones and I were invited to come out there uh, in 2015, so five years ago. And that's when they, the, the folks there uh, loaned us some horses to use and we were actually, it was Jolene again. It was because Jolene was doing this workshop with 30 foster kids, all tribal kids from around the state. And we've been doing that now, she's been doing that uh, since then is that when she has this uh, this training and a week-long training with kids, foster tribal foster kids, um, we've been using courses. And of course, kids love it. You know, it's a, um, I, I just love this approach because it's where I'm from. Uh, we're a horse culture, we're a ho you know, uh, where I'm from. And a lot of uh, places in the West, you know, we say we're, we're, we were horse nations. And that's the thing. That's the thing we're getting back to. I mentioned John Eagle uh, earlier. Man, if you can afford it, bring John up for a workshop. He, John, is the real deal. He teaches how it used to be, how we used to uh, train horses, and how we relate to them. The way you know a, a spiritual relationship and respect based on respect, not on fear. Not training the horse uh, through fear and uh, not getting on uh, like a new person, an inexperienced person about, oh, don't be afraid. Um, I really like, like it when a kid says, oh, I'm afraid. I don't know what to do. I like that because I know that in a two-hour session even, they're going to feel way better. They're going to feel more self-confident. 
uh, they're going to act interact with each other better. It always works. We tell the kids no no cussing allowed here because it's a negative thing, and the horses might pick up that, and it could be dangerous. I mean, the horse is you know pretty big. You've got to be respectful. So they they do that. We we tell them uh, you know don't be hitting each other or horsing around. Don't be running around real quick because the horse you know, could react to that and maybe it'll, it'll be a, a safety issue. So we start out like that. We start with a circle, with a prayer. And I'm telling you, in 11 years now, it works. It always works. Now, it's not considered an evidence-based or research-based. And that's fine. I don't care. Um, as long as it's a tribal best practice uh, here in Oregon and, and as that spreads, uh, other horse programs are starting. Uh, so these, these uh, Indian folks, tribal folks and natural horses, uh, horsemen that I, I really impressed with, uh, John Eagle and Thomas Smittle in uh, South Dakota, Johnson, North Dakota, at Fort Yates, um, here in Oregon, Amber Jones, Cow Creek, and then uh, in War at Warm Springs, uh, my cousin Mona Cochran, Archambault, we've done workshops there. Um, Three minutes? Oh, wow. I wonder, is there any way I could get a, here, see what a question is or hear what a question is from yeah, people? You can ask them to put it in the comments. Okay, could you put something in comments? I'm sorry I ran this late. I believe I talked this long. Um, my Blackfeet partner here, <laughs> Laura, is, is uh, pulling up on the phone um, comments or questions, whatever. Okay. I sure like to know who's out there. I hope Theta and some of these other long-term characters, well, even the new ones, Josh, Jordan, Thosh, anything you've got here. Do you, is there anything you want to comment on or question? There aren't any questions yet. Questions? So Laura's looking them up. These, you know, the Blackfeet and the Grovons used to really be at each other the old days. <laughs> We're cooperating pretty good. I got some cousins up at Browning, DeRosiers. And, uh, well, Chuck Archambo used to live up there too. Michael DeRosier, Dr. Mary DeRosier, cousins of mine. Words of advice for people in quarantine and sobriety. Words of advice for people in quarantine and sobriety. Boy, that's a that's a good one. Well, how about this basic thing again? How about culture? How about burning some sweet grass or some sage when you're just fed up? You know, you know that really works, doesn't it? I mean. I mean, look, I've been sober again 37 years. I don't have total peace of mind and stillness of heart yet. But um, it's better. And, uh, well, like, for this thing here, um, the first time we tried this and it didn't work, uh, I burned some sage and felt a lot better. Just, and um, it's just a, you know, a really simple and powerful thing, culture again. And what's the other thing that we like? We like connection. You got to just burn up your cell phone, get on there and text and call. And um, God, this Facebook, God, I hate Facebook sometimes, you know, it's a love hate thing, but man, it is helping us stay connected, just like this thing, this power hour. And uh, oh, the other one, we, you know, like, how about Standing Rock? Facebook, uh, you know, it wasn't the, the major news outlets weren't telling the whole story and asking people to come and support the tribe there. It was Facebook. And I got a kick out of it. How, you remember those of you who were there, Facebook Hill? We couldn't get coverage down in the camps. So you'd have to walk up to the hill, Facebook Hill. <laughs> I got a kick out of that. Let's see what else. Oh, let's see what else. Oh, how to do this during this. Well, here I am again, just... Uh, 
seeing what I've seen for these 37 years in recovery, that we're going to make this. We're going to get through this. And again, it's a simple thing, culture-based. And tune into this thing every noon. And if you uh, miss it for some reason, uh, come back and check it out. All of these um, presentations so far that I've loved seeing this stuff. These Robert Johnson, Lina Louie, Casey Nicholson, uh, the, the indigenous 20-something folks. Uh, I've just, I just thoroughly enjoyed seeing uh, what Jillian's put together here. I don't know what else to say. I hope. Just go ahead and wrap up. Okay. So we'll just wrap it up, I guess. Um, we want to thank uh, the Noise Project, or Foundation, I guess it's called, who helped uh, pay for this and get it going. I looked up their website. It's a pretty good deal. Uh, they have good intentions on helping with the race equity and uh, social justice stuff and environmental justice. So I think this fits in perfectly to that foundation's mission. Uh, I wanna thank Jolene and Shailene there with all the technical work because I don't know a darn thing. I can turn this computer on and off, but that's about it. I can, well, I can do email and text, but this other stuff uh, is beyond me. Anyway, I ask you to keep, or encourage you to keep uh, tuned in this power hour. And again, I want to thank my partner here. <laughs> this Hi. is Ella Hardon. <laughs> like, she is really doing the uh, the safety thing we're encouraged to do. So, anyway, that's it. I guess. Thank you all for tuning in. <laughs>